And thank you for being part of our, our afternoon session, which is a, um, a very special opportunity we have to, to welcome Darren Walker, as president of the Ford Foundation, to our ACLS annual meeting. I'm so grateful to you for accepting my, my uh, invitation, and, uh, and it's, uh, of course, my pleasure to introduce him. Um, I'm going to keep it brief. Yes. Um, Darren wants to this afternoon's session to be a conversation both with me but also with all of you. As he said, let's just make it fun. Um, and we want to get right to what I'm sure will be a lively exchange. You have many materials about him in your book, and you know that he became president of the Ford Foundation in 2013, bringing experience in community development and urban revitalization and uh, sustainability and, of course, philanthropic uh, activities to the leadership of one of the world's premier endowed philanthropies. His zeal, his verve, his energy have have really vitalized not only the foundation's programming, but its engagement with its partners and its public. Um, if you visit the foundation's website, and I encourage you to do so, you'll find numerous opportunities to communicate with um, the staff at Ford and to comment on their ideas and their um, aims and their means. Darren's spotlighting of the challenges of social inequality has both defined programming and been an occasion for his own very thoughtful reflections on the nature of philanthropic activity itself, which you saw in his essay on the new gospel of wealth. The Ford Foundation and ACLS, I'm happy to say, have cooperated for more than 60 years in building and expanding communities of knowledge, promoting democratic values, and widening educational opportunities. The foundation's support was essential to reforming ACLS in the middle of the last century, when, together with the Carnegie Corporation and the Rockefeller Foundation, they rescued our council from bankruptcy and helped new leadership move its offices to New York and establish new directions. Ford and ACLS have always been in the same East Side neighborhood um, and the same neighborhood of mission, where scholarship, research, and the social good come together. There's one passage in the New Yorker profile of Darren that especially caught my eye. Evidently, coming from high school to the University of Texas, uh, Austin, you had been uh, advised to study accounting to make sure that steady work would be uh, in your life after graduation. Um, but you had a faculty college advisor who suggested another idea, Chaucer. Could the study of late medieval English poetry, rich in its portrayal of social variety, resonate in your career? Those of us who believe that the study of the humanities is vital preparation for a career of purpose and meaning would echo that advice today. So my first question, Darren, is did you take that course on Chaucer? Well, first, thank you, Pauline. <laughs> thank you uh, for uh, the opportunity to be with you and to be with the, this remarkable group of people. And obviously, ACLS and the Ford Foundation have a deep and rich history. And I, um, as you know, leapt at the opportunity to be here today and um, came down just for this because I really wanted to um, have the opportunity to talk with you. So, I didn't take the course on Chaucer. <laughs> However, I did take a course that changed my life, and it was Stan Galansky's course on the classics. And I learned about Greece and Rome, and for a boy from Goose Creek, Texas, who, for whom the idea of education, certainly to anyone in my milieu, was the opportunity to, to be trained for a career doing something like accounting or something that was deemed beyond and certainly above the status of my mother, who was a, a, a nurse's aide, or my grandparents, grandfather who was a porter and my grandmother who was a domestic. So the idea of being an accountant in their mind was a pretty remarkable feat because it was quite improbable that uh, for their generation you would find an African American who would be an accountant. So it was only when I got to college and when I arrived in Austin and I met John Trimble 
um, who was the professor of English who um, challenged me that uh, first year um, about why I was, why I had signed up in the business school. Um, and I thought I signed up in the business school because that's what you did when you went to college. You went to business after you graduated. Um, and so it was only well, through John that I came to understand the power of the humanities. And um, I never wanted to leave school. It was one of the things that happened, um, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this. I literally, I left my home in 1978, um, and I literally never went back. Every summer, I went to summer school or I was a resident assistant, um, or I did summer orientation, because I so loved the environment uh, of being on a university campus. It was so, for me, as uh, it was just so all-embracing. And, and even in sometimes conservative 1979 Texas, um, a slightly um, off-kilter black gay man um, was able to find his footing in that um, really um, exciting environment. And I had remarkable teachers, and I, I just loved it. And so it did change my life. And it's why I say today when people ask me, and I give talks at universities all the time, and what should I, what should I do, and what should I, and I often say, you know, don't worry about that. Learn. Just learn. And, um, and learn in the broadest sense of that word. Um, and embrace knowledge. And embrace getting outside of your own comfort zone, your own head. Um, and so that's what, to my mind, this organization represents. Well, thank you. I had a feeling you probably didn't take the course on Chaucer, in the, given the context of its being mentioned, but I knew that there would be something else that, that in the oh, humanities Oh, there was lots that of would, things. Oh my that, goodness, we could, we, yes, yes, there was but I, lots I of things, but much. I didn't do the course on Chaucer. Well, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I just have to be honest. I, I actually have never taken a course on Chaucer either, so right, it's, I, it's, it's you know. something to, yeah. But uh, you, at Ford, I mean, and, and as president, you've, you've put the struggle against inequality really front and center of the mission. Uh, of the foundation and the programming. And I just wondered, what was the process that got you there? How mm. did you um, uh, arrive at that choice? I mean, there's so many other things that Well, out. I mean, in some ways, it was a rather normative foundation strategy process. Mm -hmm. A new president, uh, a number of new trustees, an opportunity for a legacy institution to take a step back and to really reflect. Um, and as we reflected on our history, the changing dynamics in the world, the environments um, in which we worked. We work in 11 regions around the world and have offices in those regions. We, we sought uh, really to understand what the largest, uh, most um, significant threats to um, our mission. And our mission is really about, as you described, advancing uh, democratic society, uh, the idea of uh, a more peaceful and uh, fair and just world. I mean, these are sort of the underpinnings of the Ford Foundation. And so we landed on, really through a pretty rigorous process, three significant threats. Uh, climate change, obviously. Um, growing insecurity in the world and growing inequality. And decided that we couldn't work on all three. Um, we, we, on a climate science foundation. I mean, they're really terrific foundations working on climate issues. Um, the issue of security is in some ways connected to the issue of inequality. Um, and inequality was a theme that we saw, whether it was in our office in Beijing, or Delhi, or Rio, uh, or New York, uh, the issue of inequality, wherever you are in the world today, is palpable. Um, and, and so for a foundation that historically was quite decentralized and felt like, depending on where you found yourself, three different foundations, because we have three divisions, um, 
And, and so what I wanted to do was to, was to reorganize the foundation with one North Star so that you wouldn't have in the arts and humanities one framework and one, one analysis and then uh, the economic development, one analysis and then human rights, another actually we, through the lens of inequality, can understand uh, the challenges for poor people, uh, people of color, women, ethnic minorities, rural people, et cetera, by really constructing um, a rigorous inequality analysis. And when you look at these things, actually patterns emerge that are pretty consistent across the world that wherever you are, people who are excluded are um, usually excluded based on issues of race, ethnicity, religion, et cetera, et cetera, gender, of course. Um, so that's how we got to mm -hmm. inequality. But the thing that was really interesting was the divergence of perspectives on the drivers of inequality. Uh, when we talk to, to technical um, experts, economists, for example, we heard that the drivers of this inequality are things like technology, automation, uh, trade and globalization, um, et cetera. When we spoke to our grantees, uh, particularly uh, people in communities, we heard a very different set of drivers. We heard things like persistent prejudice, cultural narratives, um, the rules of the political system being stacked against um, many people, um, the rules of the economy being stacked in favor of those who are advantaged and in some ways perpetuating uh, the exclusion and disadvantage of others. So it was really interesting that um, we heard these two very different um, set of rationales for why inequality is growing so much in the world. Um, but I think where we came down, actually, was, was on the latter. I mean, that actually what drives a lot of inequality um, is persistent prejudice, mm -hmm. or things like cultural narratives. And the kinds of prejudice that we see in the world, whether um, it's in India and we're talking about Dalits, or we're in Brazil and we're talking about Afro-Brazilians and indigenous people, or the United States and we're talking about African Americans um, and Latinos, um, the, there are consistent um, patterns mm -hmm. and there are consistent ways in which systems and structures within societies are organized in ways that affirm the privilege of some and affirm the disadvantage of others. And they're just consistent patterns wherever you are in the world. There are similar ways. And so therefore, it allows us to look more holistically at how we respond in in kind in terms of our grant making. Mm -hmm. um, can you t talk a little bit more about how the arts and humanities sure. um, sector actually fits into your um, uh, overall programming sure. now? Well, I think we, as you know, we've had a long history mm -hmm. with, with universities, um, obviously area studies and development economics, I mean, all sorts of things where, where I think Ford is, uh, Ford's imprint um, has, has been um, qu quite uh, profound. Um, I think today universities remain very important, um, but um, universities in some, day, in some ways are challenged by inequality. Um, the irony is I was speaking um, a while back with the president of a prominent um, university um, who had read a speech I gave about inequality that was quite provocative. And um, they said that, they, this person said that I, they really appreciated what I um, had said and the sort of kerfuffle that it caused. <laughs> and, um, and I said, well, you know, there was a time when university presidents used to make speeches like that. Um, <laughs> and, and, and they responded, I could never make a speech like that my trustees would have my head. I mean, I, I couldn't say some of the things that you said about inequality, the unfairness of the tax policies that allow hedge funds to park money offshore and not be taxed, and private equity to be taxed at 15% rather than 30, I mean, et cetera. I mean, those sorts of things, because in fact, 
those are the very people I've got to go to for my capital campaign. Mm -hmm. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't risk offending them. And I thought, this is a manifestation of inequality because in a democracy, universities are a pillar that speaks truth to power and are essential in the ecosystem of, of public discourse that's necessary in a rich and vibrant democracy where debate um, is really essential. And for university presidents to feel that they are in some ways unable to speak about some of the most important social issues of our day is really unfortunate for our democracy. But across our democracy, the institutions that we depend on to ensure its integrity are more and more compromised because of inequality. Because there is a disinvestment in the public and more and more is aggregated in the private. And so more, more attention, um, more um, need to fulfill the needs of the private uh, take priority over the public. And so, sure, a museum may need money for its education program, but if the donor says, I want to put up a fountain in front of it with my name on it, well, the fountain becomes the priority. Um, and so, it's, it's that kind of, of situation that worries me about universities. Now, specifically in terms of uh, the arts and humanities, um, as we look at inequality, I mean, for us, the question is, um, who are the voices? Who are uh, the writers? Who are the authors, the playwrights, the artists whose voices we are hearing? Um, and, and one of the things we worry about is how the voices of artists, the voices of humanists, uh, are in, in many ways uh, challenged mm -hmm. by growing inequality. And therefore, we have to, our approach is to say, how do we lift those voices? How do we lift those people, those artists, those scholars, um, who are challenging the normative um, sort of a construct of what um, is acceptable? Um, in a time when um, we know there's so much um, effort to constrain voices. So we're really asking questions. Uh, that's sort of the analysis. And so um, it's, it's, it, what it will mean is, one, we've just uh, renewed our um, support and made the largest grant last year. We made a $10 million grant for US artists because hmm. after um, uh, Jesse Helms's effort to um, end the individual artists uh, program at, at the NEA, which regrettably was successful, um, the government can no longer fund individual artists with unrestricted grants. And so U.S. Artists has now become the largest program um, to give $50,000 a year unrestricted grants to artists in seven disciplines. And so we've just um, um, given um, 10, 10 million to help ensure Great. that that program continues. Um, so that's one example of of our um, belief in uh, the importance of, of the arts and humanities. I'm glad to hear that. I'm, and I, I share your concern about the, un the role of universities in addressing this, this problem, because clearly we all know, as I mentioned earlier this morning, that um, universities should be the solution to the problem. Um, and they certainly are a better solution than almost any other solution. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, are, are they the solution or are they in, in fact exacerbating the problem in, in, in various Well, I think ways. it's one of the real challenges yeah. when you think about access because higher education is the platform for transformation in our society. And I um, feel very strongly about that because my life was fundamentally transformed the day I set foot on the University of Texas campus. Um, and I know the power of what uh, a university can do 
to change the life course and trajectory of its students. And so it is important that they be robust, independent, um, well-resourced, um, and, and not uh, beholden to um, the interests of those in power. And I think it is harder and harder to achieve that. Um, and of course, there's always been politics. I don't pretend that, I mean, we look at the 1960s and what was going on in university campuses. I mean, of course, there's, it's always been, I mean, because they're so important in a democracy, universities have always been contested places. And that's actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. Actually, you want a university to be a contested place, a place where these ideas are being thought out in, in a civil way. Um, but what you don't want is for people to be muzzled the self-censorship of feeling that I can't afford to offend this rich person because I need a capital gift from him. Um, I think it's the sort of thing that worries me because the universities are more and more dependent in a world where we're seeing these kinds of hyper levels of, of wealth accumulated on, on fewer of those people. Well, I think the role of private philanthropy has become so much more important to the survival of, of, of institutions of higher education. Uh, well, I think, I think our role in, I think our role, and I don't want to overplay what our role is. I, I, I think I, what I worry about is that we actually don't fulfill our role. Um, that we, we're the only pillar of a democracy, of this democracy, that is not beholden to election cycles to annual shareholder meetings and quarterly returns. Um, the, the kinds of things that distort the behavior of, I mean, I've worked in partnership with, uh, when you're working with politicians and as a foundation, we're not, we don't care about ribbon cuttings. It's, it's <laughs> not important to us to have a ribbon cutting. It's important to us to have impact but we don't have to drive something because we've got to get something done before the November election. And yet, we are far too conservative in our willingness to engage and our willingness to disrupt our own behavior and to really internalize our rhetoric uh, because I think if you want to see really, really wonderful prose and rhetorical flourishes about democracy and poverty and all of these things, just go look at the websites of lots of foundations. Mm -hmm. But then ask to really internalize those behaviors. And I, I can only speak for Ford um, and say that we have a long way to go. I mean, I was out giving talks about you know, the ravages of our criminal justice system and how biased it was and how terrible for the poor, uh, these men and women coming out of prison because they're, they were, there was a box on every human resources form of most corporations in America that said, if, if, have you served, do you have a criminal record? And if you checked it, most HR departments immediately discarded those those applications, and that was common practice. And so I'm out giving talks, I'm in California with Kamala Harris or whatever, and I get back and my HR department says, well, we have a box. <laughs> and I thought, what do you mean we have a box? Well, most foundations, I mean, stop. We have a box? The Ford Foundation has a box. So, you know, I said to the trustees, you know, folks, like, we really have a problem here, I think. Um, and I appreciate, you know, because the trustees will say, oh, that we loved your, your gospel of wealth and we loved it. And I said, did you read it? I mean, did you read it? <laughs> what it really said? The part, the paragraph where I said, we foundations have to interrogate our own practices, the, our contribution to inequality. And, and so I said, we're gonna do that. So, you know, I, 
you know, we've gone, up, gone through this process now, and each vice president, I had to do this, again, the, this sort of lens of analysis, and boy, what we got back from everything from HR in the box to, you know, we spend millions of dollars on vendors every year. We have absolutely no program, no perspective on diversity, on women, minority women, anything. We just willy-nilly, just, you know, spend millions of dollars. Um, uh, we, we have, an, 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 like most big foundations and universities, you know, we have a $12 billion endowment. Our policy is, you know, maximize return. So we have more money for, for grant making. Hello, I mean, that is a real problem for a foundation in my view. It's just not defensible for a foundation, well, it's, it's not defensible for a foundation that seeks to reduce and address inequality in the world, to allow this sort of thing to happen. In fact, there was a wildly shocking Guardian uh, story of a foundation that on the one hand what, had, a, had a health improvement program in the Niger Delta in its grant making program and was a funder, an investor in one of the biggest polluters of the Niger Delta. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, I mean, we really have to interrogate our practices. And it's, it's very hard. It's very hard because of the contradiction, the contradiction of what I said, right? I mean, the contradiction that, you know, we, we, we are so fortunate to not have these constraints on us, which should give us the license to really be disruptors and to really do some bold um, things. And we, including my own institution, um, do, we don't fully leverage that opportunity. Well, I would like to give our um, audience here a chance to help you think of ways in which you might do that, not, right. not that you're not doing it already. Right. So um, right here. Yeah, there's a, there are microphones here, too. It on. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, it seems clear to me that issues connected to inequalities of wealth and other kinds of inequalities are on our political and cultural agenda now in a way they weren't maybe 10 years ago. And I'm not saying that you personally are responsible for that, <laughs> but I am saying that the Ford Foundation is a big part of that story. So mm. thank you. <laughs> and, um, and, or but, um, in that wonderful text you have on, uh, towards the new gospel of wealth, you do talk about our obligation to capitalism. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder if you could talk some more sure. about that. I mean, capitalism is kind of an abstract thing, and so how can you have sure. an obligation to that? And then also, I mean, are there days or moments when you wonder whether or not a forthright commitment to addressing issues of inequality mm -hmm. and an obligation to capitalism might be fundamentally incompatible? Great question. <laughs> so I think uh, I appreciate your question and uh, I really don't think the Ford Foundation has had much to do. I think we have contributed um, as a philanthropy, I think because we have made um, a significant statement, it's contributed to the discourse. Um, I think it, uh, inequality is uh, far more palpable today in our political discourse than ever, quite honestly, because white people are feeling what African Americans and other poor people have felt for a very long time, for the first time we are seeing um, downwardly mobile white people. And the implications um, in the United States for that um, is simply um, not acceptable. And that is to say, it is in part a reflection of the challenge of race in this country um, that we uh, have reached this point and inequality um, and the issue of vulnerable people, regardless of race, has emerged as such a, a, a politically potent uh, a challenge to be reckoned with. 
um, in ways in which, as we have talked about other phenomena like mass incarceration, which, which has been talked about and debated for a very long time, um, and only recently, I agree, I would say, has become also politically um, very uh, much a part of uh, the discourse. But I think it's, it's um, the politics that we are seeing in some ways is a reflection of some of those drivers. Um, the fact that so many Americans across race and class lines see the economy, well, not just the economy, see our system as rigged. I mean, the fact that a majority of people, whenever that question is asked on whatever poll, from Pew to the Wall Street Journal, to, a majority of Americans answer yes, that it is rigged. The fact that that is now so deeply embedded in our collective psyche is so profoundly threatening to our democracy because at the core of our democracy has always been this idea, whether it was real or not, of, of opportunity and mobility. And if systems that provide opportunity and mobility are rigged, the economy, the political system, our education system, et cetera, to benefit the privileged, and not the majority, people are going to respond in really dysfunctional ways. And I think our current political discourse in some ways reflects that. I think your question about uh, uh, capitalism and our, uh, our fidelity to, to capitalism um, in its form is in some ways part of the contradiction, right? I mean, the very system that created us produces inequality. And what I would say on that is, I have never said that we have to end inequality. Most, even most progressive economists will say that within an economy, there is, of course, going to be inequality. There have to be incentives. Um, there have to be ways in which people who take risks are provided with some reward. And there also has to be a safety net and social protection for those people who are vulnerable in that setting. But the situation we have now um, is simply un unsustainable. I feel that we should, uh, we have an obligation to improve uh, capitalism because the reality is for foundations to exist, we need capitalism to work. And it, we need it to work for more people. And it's not working for more people. And so I want to be able to say, we have to make it work or we've seen what happens when it doesn't. Um, and I think we, I, I, the, the essay that you're talking about, I was writing more, specifically because I'd been in a situation where someone was reciting Adam Smith and The Wealth of Nations and making such a big, and I just was, I wanted him to understand that Adam Smith, that book was written in 1776. His first book, The Moral Sentiments of Men, was in 1759 when he laid out the moral framework uh, and, and which, which makes clear that that greed and all of these bad things happen and, and that there have to be ways in which we think about um, mitigating um, the, the, the individual impulse uh, and, and yet it's not been a part of our um, collective understanding of what, what capitalism is about. It's, and particularly, you know, about 30 years ago is it sort of greed is good and all of these, you know, the job of the, the, co the corporate, the, the job of the firm is to focus only on shareholder returns. I mean, all of that sort of mentality, which is sort of taken over um, capitalism, has been so harmful um, to it. And in fact, I was at a conference 
in, uh, in Los Angeles last week, the Milken Institute Conference, where a prominent Republican pollster um, had fresh data that were really shocking to this audience who were mostly very successful people. I think I was shocking to them too in some of the things I said, but whatever. Um, um, and you know, there were you know, really, really, this was a very sort of wealthy group of, of people, but, but he, he said that um, uh, there was a question asked of millennials. There were lots of questions, but the one he really wanted people to focus on was that um, what, uh, what do you think is the best um, organization, the best way to organize um, um, a society, communism, socialism, or capitalism? What system best works for the people? 8% said communism, 28% said capitalism, and 40, it, it didn't, because others didn't answer, but it was like 42% said socialism. And for this Republican pollster, he was completely freaked out. <laughs> Um, and he said to this group, which were many Republicans and many uh, uh, people who were very pro-business, not just Republicans, they were Democrats. I mean, it was, it was a non-partisan uh, uh, event, but these were people who are all very successful and who, as I experienced, when you start to talk to them about capitalism and talk about inequality, they sometimes can't process what you're saying because the system works for them. And so, as I say to audiences like that, it's really hard for me and you to have this conversation because part of what I need you to hear is that the system that you think you become successful through by hard work, et cetera, all of those things is rigged and it favors you. And so please don't believe that you sort of started in the batter's cage and went out onto the field, because you probably were born on first base if you were a white man <laughs> anyway. And, and, I, and I just, because it's true. I mean, and, and it's, but it's really hard. I mean, I, I got into the most difficult back and forth with the prominent CEO of a major Fortune 500 company who interrupted me at a talk and said, you know, why do I have to bear the burden of inequality? I started with nothing. My father was a bricklayer. My mother didn't have a college. He went through the usual checklist of bootstrap, et cetera, that, that, that narrative and said, so I did it, you know, and so why are you hassling me about this inequality thing? You know, and I said, sir, I'm very sorry, but you know, where you started your narrative, you started with nothing, and then there you are in 1972 in college. You were a white man in 1972, and the cusp of a remarkable transformation of the American economy, and you were like a white man with a college degree, as opposed to a white woman with a college degree, or a black man with a PhD. You were so much more privileged. And I, the data rip will show that. I mean, if you actually peel back, well, that's not what he wants to hear. He wants to embody because he needs that narrative. He needs that narrative to justify where he is in our society. And to interrogate that narrative means that he might have to come to grips with what many Americans feel, and that is that our system is not serving us and delivering shared prosperity. And that's really hard. And it's why you get such pushback from really successful Americans, particularly successful American men. Um, it's certainly what I've experienced. OK. Um. Can't see. Is there? The yes, right there. Thank you. It's hard to see into the eyes. In that um, wonderful phrase of the philanthropic field, what's what's your theory of change? <laughs> um, what are, what are the in in broad strokes, but not too broad? What what are the couple things that you you see as important to do to to change things? So, briefly, our theory of change 
is that in order to advance society and human achievement and social progress, you must, as a philanthropy, invest in three things. You must invest in ideas, knowledge. You must invest in individual leaders. And you must invest in institutions. And what I call the three eyes, um, I have a wonderful little slide, um, they are interdependent. And if you look over the 20th century across most uh, areas where we saw significant uh, advancement in the sciences, in uh, social progress, et cetera, those three things were at work. Um, they were often at work and, and, and there was an interdependence with government um, and the private sector, depending on the domain. But you've got to, we as a foundation, when we ask ourselves, what are we investing in to, to advance our mission? It's those three things. Great. Thank you. In the back on the left. In the back? OK. Thank you. I'd like to connect something that you um, were saying about um, the transformational moment that you had at the University of Texas with something that Bro Adams was saying over lunch. So you were so eloquent about the transformational moment that occurred for you when you stepped onto the campus. And then also, um, we were all sitting here laughing about your uh, anecdote about Professor Galinsky because we are from the Society of Classical Studies, so that's wonderful that you, you enjoyed his class. We'd like to invite you to join the Society as a member. By the oh, way. Yeah, I would be happy to. I would be happy um, to. But for so many students now in the US, that transformational moment, if it happens at all, is going to occur on a community college campus. Yes. Community right. colleges are affordable. There are many, many good reasons why students go there rather than a four-year college. Sometimes perhaps not such good reasons because students perhaps in some cases feel they're not good enough to go to a four-year college as the phenomenon of undermatching. What can we do to strengthen our community colleges so that they are pathways towards leadership, um, towards the arts and humanities? We've heard a bit about how Mellon and NEH are doing that, but what are your thoughts on the community college sector and its importance? I think it's hugely important, and if you look at our grants in recent years, there's been more work um, more education grant making at community colleges, uh, land grant colleges, and prisons. Um, and, and again, I think as we have looked at this question of inequality and where are vulnerable people in our society, and we think about um, low income uh, uh, people, uh, dreamers, because I think that's become an important component of our work. Um, uh, the, the uh, first generation um, community colleges are uh, the gateway. And therefore, we applauded when um, President Obama talked about uh, free access uh, to community colleges because we believe that they are essential and will be even more um, important. And they're important in part for all the reasons we know, but they're also important because because the, the lack of capacity of a lot of community colleges to fulfill their mission because they don't have the resources uh, primarily has also contributed to the growth of the for-profit uh, colleges. And uh, because many of, of the students who are enrolling in these uh, for-profits uh, would be enrolling in community colleges if there were seats. Um, and if there was capacity, um, they're not, I mean, this is the, again, the insidiousness of the system sometimes. Because when you, you know, we have funded a lot of research on the, um, the for-profit education industry in this country. And sometimes the pushback is from them is we are simply fulfilling an opportunity for students to receive an education because the public system isn't there for them. The, the, our students tried to register at the Houston Community College, but Houston Community College only had X number of seats. And the growth in population of Harris County, Texas means that there's got to be more seats. The public system can't afford it, won't finance it, and therefore we step in. And, and so 
um, that's what we worry about. Um, and, and so I, I worry about what's happening at, uh, at places like Houston Community College. I also worry about what's happening at the elites because I think there's something going on there too that is worrisome, particularly as we talk about diversity. Because we're seeing at elite colleges now, for, for the first time, we're seeing black legacies. We're seeing students who, when I went to college, and if you were among my generation of African Americans, we were all, all of us, there were, we were all from very humble backgrounds. And when you went to the black student union uh, meetings uh, in 1979, everybody there for the most part, there, were, there might be one or two whose parents was a doctor or a lawyer or something, but for the most part, uh, we were all from pretty much the same status. I would, I would challenge you to go to uh, meetings of, of African American or Latina, but particularly African Americans, because I see it myself. I see it with my friends. I, 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 who, whose you know, children do very well, um, in part uh, because they too are privileged. And yes, race still matters, but if you are a young African American at Dalton or Trinity in Manhattan, um, in many ways, uh, you are a much more desirable uh, candidate for admission uh, than a poor African American kid from a, a working class or um, a public housing project. Um, and that's, that ought to worry us. But the universities, of course, they get double, triple whammies because they're getting legacies, they're getting an African American or a minority, and they're getting someone who doesn't need financial aid. <laughs> I mean, who wouldn't except <laughs> Uh, uh, right? I mean, and so, so, but there's something happening at the top. So we're seeing the way inequality is manifesting is we're seeing at community colleges what's happening and the growth of these insidious bad actors in terms of some of the private educators, uh, private colleges. And then at the elites, we're seeing, you know, Jack, the Jack Kent Cooke uh, Scholarship Fund did research on this issue. Um, 30% of legacies who apply to Harvard are admitted. One in 16 low-income applicants to Harvard it, uh, is admitted. And, and of course there are differentials, and we understand why, that it's, I'm not correlating perfectly here, as we never do that with a group of researchers, but clearly there's something going on, um, and we need to ask questions about that, and, and all of this in my mind is part of this larger gestalt of the way in which in education inequality is manifesting. I mean, so from the very top with self-censorship by presidents and trustees and the kind of distorted behavior that happens at that level, all the way down to you know, fundamental access for the most vulnerable into community colleges and land-grant universities. Well, thank you, Darren. You've given us a lot to think about. Oh, Some of it, um, we, uh, those of you who are interested, especially in this problem, can continue talking about in the, the breakout sessions that follow, uh, one of which is, is focused on this. There are five other topics that are in your book, and I hope you will find yourself at one of these sessions. If you wish you could be in two places at the same time, you can try. Um, but don't worry, because summaries of the sessions will appear on our website shortly after the meeting. Um, so please um, uh, take advantage of these opportunities, and please join me in thanking Darren oh, Walker. Thank you. We're very glad that you're oh, president of the Ford Foundation. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.